thrilled to be joined today by Mary Dietrich, who is a nephrologist. Um, she's also the chief medical officer and executive vice president of U.S. Renal Care, as well as co-founder and partner of Boise Kidney and Hypertension Institute. Dr. Dietrich, thank you for joining us. Todd, thank you for having me. Under your leadership, uh, U.S. Renal Care has really focused on monoclonal antibody therapy to high-risk patients in dialysis facilities. I'm just wondering why that became an area of focus for you. Sure, and you're exactly right. So I uh, oversee the medical care from a corporate standpoint at, at U.S. Renal, and we're a dialysis company. So we take care of lots of dialysis patients around the United States. And dialysis patients were uniquely adversely impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, and I think the reasons for that are, are multiple. First of all, they often have um, multiple health problems, um, it, like high blood pressure or diabetes. They are often elderly. And then importantly, uh, dialysis can be done in center or at home. And for those patients that come into a facility, they transit through the community regularly. And then they congregate, uh, with multiple other people for hours at a time, several times a week. And so we saw that, um, a lot of our patients were being impacted by COVID, getting the infection. And then when they did, they had a very high risk of hospitalization and a high mortality. And our options were limited about how to mitigate that. The treatments that were emerging at the time my interest in this started were largely focused in the hospital, steroids and, and uh, remdesivir, convalescent plasma, those were all for inpatients. And, uh, really sick people. So when I read the article in the New England Journal of Medicine about the use of these therapies in outpatients uh, with moderate um, symptoms, mild to moderate symptoms, but high risk of progression, that seemed like an obvious thing that might benefit our patients. I'm curious as to what the first step was. So you read the article in the New England Journal. You thought this was an opportunity for your patient population. What did you do next? So the first thing I did when I um, developed an interest in uh, making this therapy available was to reach out to our affiliated physicians, our physician partners, and see if there was interest among my colleagues in making this therapy available. And I found a lot of interest. And then the next step was to reach out to the applicable state health departments and try and obtain the drug from them. And I know that U.S. Renal has facilities in, I think, almost 40 states. So I'm just curious as to, did you focus on all the states or did you target a few? We targeted a few. Actually, Alaska was the first place that we got the therapy because we had a a uh, physician who was really anxious to uh, to procure and administer the therapy. At that time, there were limited supplies. There wasn't a lot known about the drug, so it was challenging to try and obtain the drug. So one of the key accelerators of our ability to obtain in a timely manner and administer these medications was our collaboration with the Speed program, which is a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services program set up for the equitable and efficient distribution of the COVID-19 monoclonal antibodies. We worked closely with these group of people whose entire focus was on prioritizing distribution to nursing homes, dialysis centers, federally qualified health centers, et cetera, to get um, timely distribution of the therapeutics. And that partnership was critical to our success, in, in my opinion. You know, it's interesting. I, as I'm listening to you, I'm struck that it's both a federal focus through FDA as well as the state focus within the individual health departments and then the individual physicians that, that you partner with. So there's a lot of players. Um, is there, as you've talked with each of them, what are sort of the similarities and differences in your experience? So 
first of all, there was at the time that we were initially exploring use of this medication, there was some degree of uh, desperation to be able to intervene, to be able to impact the course in vulnerable patients um, prior to them getting to the hospitals. And that was key because um, the hospitals were getting overwhelmed. So I would say a similarity was a motivation to um, get this therapy in the hands of people who were willing to use it on high risk patients and prevent the influx into the hospital. The logistics of giving these medications was complicated. So it's an IV infusion, and uh, initially it was given over an hour, and then there was an hour-long um, uh, observation period after the infusion. It had to be given as soon as possible, ideally within four days, that was how it was tested, of symptoms. So the logistics of identifying a symptomatic patient, getting them tested, then getting them to a center that had this, and uh, um, talking a COVID-positive patient into sitting for two hours in an infusion center was challenging. We, as dialysis companies, were uniquely poised to be able to do this because we had uh, centers that, at that point, were comfortable managing COVID uh, outpatients, and we had access to the bloodstream through, you know, vascular access for dialysis. We had nurses trained in emergency um, processes, and we had access to medicines uh, readily available to treat anaphylaxis, which is a potential, though incredibly rare, side effects of these. So the stars aligned for us to be a good place to administer this therapy. We had high-risk patients and logistic um, capabilities in order to give it. And to date, how many patients have you been able to administer the therapy to? So early on, we gave a lot of the drug, and then as the pandemic slowed down, we uh, gave a lot less. I think we've given 70 doses of the medication to date. And, and you had mentioned that things had slowed down. Obviously, we're recording at a time where their cases are going back up, and I'm just curious as to how, what your plans are for the next couple of months. So we're rapidly ramping up, getting the drug and being able to administer it. Todd, I'll tell you that one of the real challenges with these therapies from our standpoint is the very frequent changes in um, dosing and administration guidelines that have occurred as we've gained experience with these uh, medications. So initially, we gave a medication called bamlanivimab, and then the dose changed on bamlanivimab, and then it was to be given with another medication called etacevimab, and then infusion times changed, and then whether we gave it on dialysis or after dialysis, and then that was paused, and we went to Regeneron, and then the dose changed to Regeneron. So my point in telling you all that is the change management required to keep up with all these changes at a time when our clinics were swamped with COVID and vaccine administrations, et cetera, has been uh, an impediment, I think, to giving the medications because we had to keep re-educating and updating our policies, et cetera. But right now we get are getting increasing requests for the Regeneron therapy, which is what we're using now. So if, if you um, were responsible for the approach in the United States to this therapy and you could address that challenge in terms of kind of the, the changing rules, if you will, which sound a lot of it sounds like just sort of changes in, in clinical understanding. How, how do you how do you fix that problem? Because it sounds like that could be really daunting. Right. I'm not sure I have an answer, especially since we don't have a retrospectoscope, <laughs> which would have been yeah. handy for lots of reasons in the pandemic. But I think as the science evolved on this, these were necessary changes, especially in response to our understanding of the variants and the the activity of these medications, uh, uh, you know, against the variants. So that 
what I just stated was not meant to be a criticism of the way this is rolled out. I think there have been genuine investments in, in systems and processes to make distribution and administration of this medication streamlined. I just think it's the reality of evolving therapeutics during a pandemic with a changing virus. I do have learned a lot about the, you know, the response and the the federal government has done some really innovative things to educate people um, on these monoclonals. How did you, were there any patients that did better or worse? Was there any way you could sort of get a sense as to um, sort of proactively being identified who was going to do best with this treatment? So we actually presented and have talked a fair amount about our outcomes in our first 40 patients that were given the medication. And we saw a dramatic reduction in hospitalizations within seven days, as well as mortality. But we're very cautious in the way we interpret that data. And this is why. As I mentioned, to get the therapy, a patient has to have symptoms or get tested for COVID, get the results of the test, be identified as positive, and then be set up, consented for the infusion, and given the infusion. And at U.S. Renal Care, that process on average took about four days. So in order to even be eligible for the therapy, you had to stay out of the hospital for four days, four early days of your disease. And we know that our average time from diagnosis to hospitalization was five days. So I think there's immortal time bias in our results. But anecdotally and um, consistent with other studies, we did see fewer patients administered the therapy going to the hospital and dying. And we had reports of pretty remarkable symptom turnarounds in patients that got the the medication. So we believe it to be helpful, and my colleagues in the industry report similar findings. So I do think this therapy is beneficial in in the population that we're using it in. We'd started to have the conversation about the the Delta variant in general, just variants. Um, I'm kind of curious for because a significant number of dialysis patients have been vaccinated. If if one of your dialysis patients is who is vaccinated gets sick, um, how, would they be eligible to receive the treatment as well? They are. The EUA allows for any patient with a, a diagnosed COVID infection to get it regardless of vaccine status. And in addition, there's a post-exposure indication. So for a high-risk exposure, these medicines seem to mitigate symptomatic infection, infection and certainly symptomatic infection. So breakthrough infections could be and actually have been treated with these therapies. I don't think there's large trials on the outcomes in that situation, but uh, it is allowed to be able to do that. So what about a person who has been vaccinated, has had not up until this point um, been infected, then gets infected? So they've been, evac- they've been vaccinated, they have a breakthrough infection. Would they be eligible for the monoclonal antibody therapy? They would. So the specifications in the EUA say you have to have a positive um, SARS-CoV-2 test. And so it's it's agnostic to whether that's a breakthrough infection or an infection in an unvaccinated patient. Just to shift gears a little bit, I'm curious as to um, sort of as you, I know you've been throughout the pandemic, you've been in constant communication with the chief medical officers of other dialysis organizations and other leaders in the community. I'm just sort of curious as to your conversations. Um, have there been efforts to try to pool data or share data or just sort of how are you working together with, with your colleagues on this issue? Right. So the collaboration throughout the pandemic on innumerable issues has been remarkable between the different dialysis organizations as well as the whole sort of renal industry. And we share 
uh, experiences, best practices, and data frequently. I talk regularly during the initial days of giving this medication with most of the CMOs uh, at the other dialysis companies. We have not pooled data and um, to, to publish it, um, but we've shared data. We've shared data on the ASN CMO calls. I did an ASN webinar and shared data as well. In addition, this speed program that I talked about ran a series called the ECHO series, which was a lecture series to educate on monoclonal antibodies. So people from a variety of health systems, hospitals, infusion centers, nursing homes, dialysis centers, got together and, and shared with one another and with the broader community our experiences and data. So those are the main places data has been shared outside of the published literature on this. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been published data in our dialysis population for these medicines. And I think it's because overall the numbers have been somewhat low and there is this bias in the data that makes us unwilling to, <laughs> to publish it, but we talk about it. As you sort of think back, it's it's been almost, uh, you know, it's been a year really that you've been working in this arena. What do you what do you wish you had known before you started thinking about um, this treatment? What I wish I knew at the beginning that I know now is the safety profile that's evolved from these medicines. There's increasing data that the use of these medicines is safe, and we were acting on small data sets at the beginning of our use of this medicine. The second is the tolerability of the medicine. So there was a lot of concern uh, on my part and others about whether patients would have anaphylaxis or other issues uh, with the administration of the medicine. And again, this is a very, in my experience and others, these are well-tolerated therapies. And then finally, I mentioned the evolving guidance on whether we could give it on dialysis. What's the right dose? What is the right timing of the infusion? It would be nice to be as certain about those things as I think we're getting to be. And then the final thing is activity against the variants was a big concern. As these variants were evolving, it would be comforting to know, which we didn't know, about the activity of the, the retention of activity among the common variants of concerns, particularly with Regeneron. As you may know, another medication that was used, Bamlanivimab, is, uh, De had decreased activity against the variant and was actually paused. Its use was paused during the pandemic. Why do you think it was that, that this therapy appealed to you so much that you wanted to learn more about it and pursue it? Because as you said, you, you were early in terms of thinking about this as a possible way forward at a time when you know, we were heading toward crisis. And just sort of curious if, if you sort of take a step back and sort of think about um, your thought process, kind of what you think was the driver? That's a great question. So I have been an innovative physician willing to try new things um, since early in my career, and I'm not exactly early <laughs> in my career anymore. That's one. The second is I, despite being a chief medical officer, am a clinician, so I'm clinically active, and I was watching patients being impacted by COVID. So I think I had a real sense of the impact of COVID on, on our patients and was desperate to be able to alter the course of the therapy or alter the course of the disease that I saw as so um, devastating in our patients. In addition, I had a large support network in which I thought that I could um, safely administer this, where I could get questions answered, a community that could collaborate to do this together. So I think the support I had 
my willingness all along to be fairly innovative as well as my clinical presence among these patients were instrumental to why I was a champion of these therapies early on. And I guess I'm curious about the patient reaction. So as you had a conversation with a, a patient and had to explain the therapy and then, you know, if you did administer it um, and then afterwards, I'm just curious as to what their reaction has been or what that discussion is like. So I mentioned all of the reasons that dialysis uh, facilities were optimally poised to give this medication our patients were consented for the medication by their own doctor. And I contrast that to other settings, um, such as infusion centers, where a patient may go and have a clinician that's unknown to them consenting them, or emergency rooms where they were doing this. So the patients that we were consenting for this therapy were our own patients who we had a relationship with and they it was being administered in the facility where they regularly received care by trusted staff they didn't have to leave and go to another place to get this so our patients were um, very open to this. I, we had some patients who declined the therapy when they were consented for it or when it was offered to them. But in general, I think we rolled this out at a time when patients were scared of COVID. And then all of those other things that I described to you, I think, led to good patient acceptance of this and a willingness to try it. Well, Dr. Dietrich, thank you for taking the time to, to discuss um monoclonal antibody therapy, and, and really just to, to thank you for your efforts on behalf of your patient population and in the broader kidney community. It really, you've really led the way in this arena, and, and I hope that um, everyone listening both understands that, but also from our discussion gains some insights into to the therapy and the potential opportunities for their patients. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be a resource, and I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to talk about our experience with these therapeutics. As of Monday, September 13th, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services transitioned from the direct ordering process from Amerisaurus Bergen to a state-territory coordinated distribution system, which is similar to what they used from November 2020 through February 2021. The federal government will determine the weekly amount of monoclonal antibody products each state and territory receives based on the COVID-19 case burden and the utilization. State and territorial health departments subsequently identify which sites in their respective jurisdictions receive product, as well as the amount each site receives. Individuals or facilities will need to contact their state health departments to request monoclonal antibodies.